I've got something in my pocket and it's terribly uncomfortable. <laughs> so we're taking a look at the ASRock Z170 Extreme 7 Plus. This motherboard is for Skylake, so if you've been living under a rock and you don't know what Skylake is, you should go watch our Skylake introduction video. Although I'm betting you're probably just considering, oh, there's Skylake options, we should look at that. So the Z170 chipset is a different motherboard socket, and that's socket 1151. There are i3, i5, and i7 CPUs available, as well as eventually, probably, Pentium and Celeron variants that will use that, that type of a socket. The 1151 socket is necessary because uh, Intel has moved away from the fully integrated voltage regulator. Uh, you, you guys may have seen the fully integrated voltage regulator on like the Haswell processors, it was the Fiverr, and it's gonna be our salvation and the processor is gonna be able to respond more quickly to ramp ups and power and blah, blah, blah. And it definitely did do all of those things. There are <laughs> notes that I've seen in design briefs that uh, suggest that the voltage circuitry in the Skylake actually ramps up its how much it needs from like an idle state to a production state uh, slowly so as not to overload the VRM componentry on the motherboard because one of the reasons to have the fiber on the chip was to give the CPU the ability to demand more power more quickly and it's not really like that with Skylake anymore because the power delivery circuitry has moved back onto the motherboard but that means that the overclocking headroom should be a little bit better and so the Z170 Extreme 7 also includes some overclocking features. Now for our sample CPU we have been able to hit 4.7 gigahertz on that. That is with good water cooling. And disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. This is a, basically a launch day video or very soon after a launch of Skylake. We don't have a lot of production units to sample with. However, our internal sources that have been testing the production lines say that, a, that about 50% of the Skylake desktop CPUs, that's the i5 and the i7, 6700K and 6600K, those are unlocked multiplier CPUs, will hit 4.6 gigahertz, about 50%, give or take. 4.8 gigahertz is an extremely rare critter though. So if you're looking for a super massive overclock to go from the four gigahertz stock of the i7 version of Skylake to go from 4.0 gigahertz with a, a turbo of 4.2 to something more like 4.5 or 4.6, you've got a 50% shot at it. 4.7, the, the fall off is really rapid, 4.8, it's going to be pretty rare from what from what we can tell just based on innuendo rumor some crazy chinese astrology and some other some other variables some other hand wavy things so we don't actually know however z170 extreme 7 for what it's worth for the cpu that we have we hit 4.7 no problem and that was on a good liquid cooler we were actually using the nzxt kraken uh, x61 basically worked out uh, well for us. If you're using a, a triple radiator, you may be able to do a little bit better than that, depending on how much voltage you're able to run it up to and, and how much heat you can dissipate. But overall, this motherboard has a lot more to offer than just overclockability. So in terms of power delivery for the new CPU socket type, this is a 12 phase power design that's using the XXL aluminum alloy heatsink, 60 amp chokes. It's got a dual stack MOSFET, Nishikon 12K platinum caps, and premium alloy chokes for the memory modules as well. Now this is, of course is DDR4, so if you're using the Z170 chipset, by and large it's gonna be DDR4, although Skylake does actually support DDR3 on the memory controller and DDR4, although I think, I'm not sure about this, but I think that the desktop parts only support DDR4 by default, but you can do some trickery to get them to support DDR3. Where you're gonna see DDR3 is probably on portable devices and low power devices where it's important to maintain low power. For this particular board, you've got four DDR4 DIMM slots, and I'm happy to report that using our G-Skill overclocking memory, we hit three gigahertz all day long. We should be able to hit about 3.4 gigahertz with this design, give or take, on the memory clock. But this is not an overclocking video. We're probably going to do that in another video later. I just wanted to report the XMP profile for 3 gigahertz worked fine with this out of the box. No tweaking. It was perfect. We've actually got four full length PCI Express Gen 3 slots. Now, the first slot is a by 16 slot that can operate in by 16 or by 8. If you're going to use two graphics cards, that's going to be a by 8 by 8 configuration. And that's going to pull directly from the PCI Express resources that are available on the CPU. Now, the CPU connects to the chipset through a new thing called DMI 3.0. Effectively, that opens up four more PCI Express Gen 3 lanes that's available to the rest of the motherboard. And that is how ASRock has implemented the rest of the peripherals on this system. We've actually got three SATA Express ports 
on this. And this actually comes with a SATA Express peripheral, which is a USB 3.1 adapter. Now this is just a normal uh, PCI Express as media controller and this shows you that Intel sort of understands that SATA as an as an interface is really just becoming more like a generic bus and so the lines between SATA and PCI Express are blurred even further with the Z170 chipset and the evidence for that is with the USB 3.1 front panel connector that comes with this motherboard. Now it's a five and a quarter inch form factor which is a little strange. I think it should be you know three and a half inch or something else maybe maybe an io backplate version because how much would an io backplate cost to include but it gives you two extra usb 3.1 10 gigabit per second ports usb 3.1 type c that's the reversible one and the usb 3.1 type a and that's of course powered by an as media chip and if you look at the interface here we can see that this is basically a pci express adapter but on a card and so it comes with a cable that will go from your pci express connector to this front panel connector and so you can use this on the front panel of your computer which is perhaps a more convenient location you know in a lot of the cases that we've tested the usb 3.0 ports on the front of the case maybe have trouble driving like the power hungry you know usb 3.0 flash drives or usb hard drives and that kind of thing that will not be a problem with the usb 3.1 adapter from asrock it actually has separate power delivery circuitry not only does it uh, have the physical connector for the power supply there's also another interface that connects directly to the motherboard with another header that's on the printed circuit board for that. So you can deliver quite a bit of power through the USB 3.1 standard and USB type C in particular for f cell phone recharging, that kind of thing. And ASRock provides that with the connectivity on this. This motherboard has three M.2 slots, which you can use with PCI Express M.2 SSDs, including the Intel 750 SSD, although you'd have to get an adapter board that will break it out to the U.2 or the mini SAS style connector on the, on the M.2 slot because the Intel SSD is so fast that it won't fit in the M.2 form factor. So you sort of get a cable to go out from that to something else. Finally, with all the PCI Express and M.2 and SATA Express connectivity, the Intel rapid storage stuff supports RAID on the PCI Express side of things now. So if you're using a bunch of these peripherals, if you're using a bunch of M.2 drives, you can now RAID them together. So if you want something that's ludicrously fast and dangerous with your data, you can run RAID 0. You could get two M.2s, RAID 0 that, and then you're looking at, at on the order of, you know, four or five gigabytes per second with the absolute fastest M.2 SSDs that you can get, putting those in a RAID 0 just to get as much speed as you can. So with all the extra connectivity, the USB 3.1, the USB 3.1 at the front and the back, the extra PCIe slots, it sort of becomes clear why you need the extra four lanes of PCI Express 3.0 connectivity through the DMI 3.0 interface between the CPU and the rest of the chipset. That's why Intel has done that with this particular chipset, and that's why this motherboard has been implemented the way that it's been implemented. All right, let's take a look at the back of the board. First off, we've got two USB 2.0 ports and a combo PS2 mouse and keyboard port. Then we've got a DVI connection. That DVI connection supports up to 1920 by 1200. Then we've got a DisplayPort 1.2 connection and HDMI. Now on the DisplayPort connection and the HDMI connection, both of those connections should be rated for 3840 by 2160 at 60 hertz or 4096 by whatever at 24 hertz. Next to that, we've got our As Media USB 3.1 10 gigabit per second USB ports, one type A and one type C. Next to that, we've got our two Intel Gigabit LAN adapters, and then we've got four USB 3.0 ports. Now for the audio, it's a Realtek ALC 1150 codec. It's a 7.1 channel with optical SPDIF, but there is a TI-NE 5532 premium headset amplifier. The headset amplifier supports headsets with a resistance of up to 600 ohms. That particular TI op amp is pretty decent on paper, although Logan would have to tell you about the music quality and the particulars about the actual audio codec. The capacitors are Nichicon Gold audio capacitors, so that should help elevate the audio quality, and in independent tests, it has about 115 dB signal to noise ratio. If you, if you want to know more about the audio testing, let me know because I can actually post a document about that. Now in terms of other connectivity on this motherboard, there is a COM port header and a TPM header in case you need to use a TPM module, that's sort of a security feature. There are a total of five four pin fan headers 
uh, that are individually controllable through the UEFI. Fortunately, in the UEFI, you can customize each individual fan with your own custom profile if you want. And there's also, I think, four preset fan profiles that you can pick. So you've got two headers for the CPU and three headers for chassis fans that are sort of scattered conveniently throughout the motherboard. There's also, of course, the front panel audio connector at the corner of the motherboard. You've got one Thunderbolt AIC connector and support for Thunderbolt in the UEFI, but in order to actually get the Thunderbolt ports, you'll have to buy a PCI Express add-in card in order to expose the connectivity there. You've got one Dr. Debug LED output. That's the two seven segment LED displays that will give you postcodes so that you can help diagnose what the situation is with the machine. You know, should it not post, that will help you figure it out. In the corner near the ATX power connector, you've got a reset button and a power button that's convenient. Then the front panel header is located at the lower bottom corner of the motherboard. This motherboard actually features two BIOSes. It's got two 128 megabit AMI UEFI uh, BIOSes with a multilingual GUI support. So you've got one main BIOS and one backup BIOS. The way that you switch between them is with a little switch at the bottom edge of the motherboard. So if you're doing a UEFI update like the internet flash and then the power goes out or something goes horribly wrong, well, you can flip the switch and then use the other BIOS. Then you can flip the switch again and actually use the internet update to fix the one that got corrupted. Now of course the chipset drivers if you are upgrading an existing system, you will want to update your drivers before you actually switch systems. Now, here's a hint. The disk controller requires XHCI drivers. Now, you can operate from the BIOS in AHCI mode or in RAID mode. RAID mode is going to give you a couple of extra options, even if you're not really operating in RAID, including Intel Rapid Resume and some other things. But to really take advantage of those, you have to create special partitions on your SSD in order to be able to you know, do the fast suspend to RAM and the fast wake up from RAM and those kinds of things. There are utilities to help you do that and there are some utilities in the UEFI that will help you get the drivers for things that are operating in those modes. This is the first time in a while that I've actually switched, you know, I, I sort of, we've got a Windows installation that's ready to go on an M.2 drive. I took the M.2 out and put it in this, booted it up and it was like inaccessible boot device. And that's a sign that things have changed. So it may be possible for me to update the drivers on that installation of Windows on a machine that it works on and actually be able to boot up. But Windows, you're not really supposed to do it that way. Like that's the wrong way to do it. But I thought it was interesting that enough has changed finally because this hasn't happened since. I mean, I think Z77 to Z87 to Z97, I've been able to basically take a couple of SSDs and sort of carry it forward just to see what would happen. And uh, this one would not do that. This one I got an inaccessible boot device. And I think that's owing to the fact that the RAID setup and the, the chipset drivers in terms of SATA storage on this are just a little different than they used to be. So to make a long story short with the driver situation on this motherboard, you really want to be running Windows 8 or Windows 10 for full support of everything. However, Windows 7 is supported. So if you're on Windows 7 and you want to use Windows 7, it should work fine. Although you may need to create a driver CD or a driver installation USB and copy the drivers necessary to actually run this motherboard onto the USB so that when you do the installer, you can actually detect the hard drive. Because otherwise you boot up and the installer's like, I, I don't see a hard drive. Where's the hard drive? Well, you gotta install the driver so that it can actually see the hard drive. The UEFI will actually help you do that. There's an option in there that will create uh, an installation CD or that will create a uh, driver CD um, directly from you know, sort of the internet or the resources that are available in the UEFI. I did not test that because I do not care about Windows 7. In fact, I barely care about Windows 8 and Windows 10. Good news. Linux works great, it detects all the peripherals on this motherboard, Intel, everything is good, except for the onboard video. The onboard video has some kind of a problem right now, it will actually cause the machine to reset. I would suggest that you use an add-in graphics card if you're going to immediately upgrade to this. There's probably going to be a kernel update or something to fix this, maybe a problem with the Iris Pro graphics, maybe it's something you can be fixed in the UEFI. I did not diagnose it beyond just plugging in an SSD, booting it and saying, hmm. It reboots when it gets to the graphical initialization part. And if you don't need a GUI, you'll be fine. So I have a feeling that there's probably a, a kernel command line parameter or something that you can initialize and just tell it like no VGA or something, and it would probably initialize just fine. And that's probably owing to the updated graphics in the Iris Pro that's actually in the Skylake CPUs. Those theoretically will bring DirectX 12 support on the Windows side of things. And so Linux, because this is launch day, probably hasn't been updated for that. Although I'm kind of surprised that it crashes so spectacularly. But again, it's only one data point. Your mileage may vary, may not really be a big deal. But hey, with the new platform launch, stuff for Haswell's on fire sale right now. And that stuff is really gonna work well on Linux. So if you're looking for Linux and you want a bargain system and you're not ready to upgrade to DDR4, Check out the 1150 stuff that's on fire sale. You can get USB 3.1 there as well. 
Dr. Debug is a feature of this motherboard that allows you to diagnose what's wrong, like if the RAM won't post or whatever. It reads out codes. There's numeric codes that come on a seven segment LED display at the bottom edge of the motherboard. And the manual, because you looked at the manual, right, has this handy table of what each code actually means. And so things can actually be, you know, D8, invalid password, FF, please check if the CPU is installed correctly. Most people don't realize, but you know, the CPU is wired directly into the memory. It's not like the old school days where, you know, the memory would go into a thing and then the, th and then the thing went into the memory slots. I've actually seen several times where a CPU was not installed exactly perfectly. A machine would post, but there would be weird problems with one of the RAM slots or two of the RAM slots. And reseeding the CPU, just sort of fiddling, like unloosening it and sort of moving it around the, you know, quarter of a millimeter that you've got it to play in there and then sort of just bringing the lever back down, actually fixed memory problems and interface problems. You want to be really careful if you're, if you're doing one of these from scratch, I'd suggest that you check out our how to build a PC video um, for more information on how to build a PC. Not a lot's really changed, but the pins are actually in the CPU socket. And if you touch those, it's game over. If you bend those, it's game over. If you look at those funny and something weird happens, it's game over. It's not going to work. It's going to be really bad. So you don't want to touch the CPU. You don't want to touch the pins. You don't want to set the CPU CPU like down on its corner in the pins because that's going to ruin everything. Really, honestly, installing the CPU is the most harrowing thing about installing, <laughs> about building a computer. And if you're just really careful and you just sort of put it in exactly right, watch a bunch of our videos because we've got lots of video of how to do it correctly, uh, you'll be fine. So keep that in mind. Now, our version of this motherboard does not actually have onboard wireless, but there is actually a half size mini PCI Express slot that you could put in a combo Bluetooth and uh, you know 802.11 AC wireless if you want. And then there's breakouts on the back so that you could actually put wires there. You can also get a version of this motherboard that has built-in wireless if you need to locate it somewhere that it actually has wireless. I like the fact that this has several M.2 slots because actually a lot of the newer, cooler, wireless adapters that have Bluetooth and near field communication and some of the other, you know, really high end features are available as mini PCI express. And so the mini PCI express will actually go into the M.2 slots. And because these M.2 slots are wired into the PCI express bus, it'll work fine. You might not use the mini PCI express slot, but you've got both options on this motherboard. Now it is only a half length slot for that. So you're not going to be able to put a cellular radio in or anything like that and actually have it screw in. But, you know, you do have both form factors depending on what kind of a wireless card you want to get. Now in terms of board layout and in terms of expansion slots, you've got four by 16 slots. Now those will work in a by 16 configuration with just one slot by eight by eight with two slots or by eight by four by four or by eight by four by four by one. And then you've got two PCI Express by one slots that are also available for expansion. Now, depending on what combination of peripherals you use, some of those ports and some of the M.2 slots may be disabled. So depending on what your actual build is, you may want to double check how you plan to use your peripherals to know if you're going to have enough PCI Express lanes. Unless you're really starting to do a lot of crazy stuff, like you've got, you know, SLI plus a lot of M.2 connectivity plus SATA Express, you're probably not going to run into a problem with lanes. And keep in mind, effectively, Skylake has four more PCI Express Gen 3 lanes than Haswell and Socket 1150 did. So in terms of running a lot of peripherals, you're gonna have a lot more connectivity than you did on, on prior platforms. So the ASRock Z170 Extreme 7 Plus, what do you guys think? You guys wanna see a build with this? Let us know in the forum over at techsyndicate.com. I'm Wendell and I'm signing out and I'll see you next time.